Today is Monday, November 14th, 2016. I'm called the County Commissioner's Morning to Order. Today we have Mike Martin from South Georgia Baptist Church. He will be our evening host. So if you'll please stand, you may stand at your place. Heavenly Father, thank you for being in this place. Father, today we are faced with with big decisions, we're, we're faced with uh, varying kinds of conflicts and troubles and, and difficulties. And we, we pray, Father, for, for wisdom. We, we pray, Father, uh, for unity. We pray, Father, that, that you would guide and direct and that you would be glorified in our community. We thank you for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. On the honor of the Texas flag, I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Okay, number one is recognition of minutes from the October 24, 2016 meeting. Here's the question that's been recognized. Two budget amendments to consider and then upon approving budget amendment for 2016 2017 fiscal year. Here you go. Turn on that. Carrie, I, I don't understand the trades, but I see the description from unit salaries and expenses to cover that from general funds. Is that was that expected? Is this an end of year item, or is there something unusual this year? to consider and act upon the approval of the payment of vouchers process out of the county auditor's office for the period of October 20, 2016 to November 9, 2016, check numbers 171538 through 171993, and wire transfers 802 through 812 in the amount of $2,902,668.80. Any questions? No. Uh, Second for discussion. I have one quick question, Judge. Okay. Carry page 10 of 53, check number 171679, Plains Builder, roughly 35,000 fairgrounds Bill Cody covered area. Is this our last payment under the work here? We are. Okay. Um, Tad, is there an update on the contracts, the revised contract that I requested a couple months ago for us to start kind of looking at that draft? As a part of this agreement, if I remember correctly, they are to now take over their own <coughs> property insurance. I think last time I reported, I did talk to the <coughs> Tri State Expos Council and they're aware of that. So it's a matter of preparing the amendment to this. Are we taking the lead on that or are they? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Hence the reason for <laughs> the question. And they were to split the cost with y'all to do the purpose. So, Ted, would it be appropriate to have this on as a next agenda item, at least for an update, if we don't have an actual contract or, or a revision kind of in place? Yes, and I'm noting that. Uh, I don't recall when the insurance begins. I think it's. <coughs> um, 
So my question during the amendment would be, do we want to carry the coverage as it is through the middle date, or make that change and have them seek some sort of premium reimbursement? The way I understood the agreement at that time was when we were done with the project, they would take over the insurance, and I'll look to it. Okay, I would submit it that way in discussing the process. Harry, is that your recollection as well? It's not just to say we'll go through another phase six and another five insurance package. It's a good point. <laughs> and by the way, Ted, do you know that their insurance renewed in July? I don't know. Yes. That's my recollection. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's July. We just did it. Do you know when mine was? <laughs> 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 I wish I could help you with that. Okay. Thank you, Judge. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we have a motion and a second. All in favor of the vouchers, raise your hand. All in favor. Okay, insurance item. Should we have uh, some insurance report? Is there anything new you want to discuss, Kay? No, ma'am. Okay, that's good. Thank you. So recognized. Number five is the Home Care and Hospice Month to consider and act upon our proclamation declaring November 2016 as Home Care and Hospice Month. I'm assuming Ms. Arvo Lord, is that you? No. No? I have Edie Reynolds. I'm sorry. Okay. Couldn't make it. okay. Edie Reynolds. Okay. <laughs> she asked me to go ahead and read this as one, one more page, so bear with me. Whereas home care services provide high quality and compassionate health care services to those in need, especially at times of community or personal health care crisis. And whereas home care is the most preferred method of health care delivery among disabled, elderly, chronically ill individuals eager to live independently in their own homes as long as they possibly can. And whereas home care in Texas is a growing alternative to hospitalization or other intuition-based institution-based forms of health care for acute chronic illnesses, providing Care to hundreds of thousands of Texans each year. And whereas the Texas Association for Home Care and Hospice and Home Care and Hospice Providers in Texas have declared November 2016 as Home Care and Hospice Month with the theme of the care you need in the home you love. We are calling on all Texans to observe this occasion with appropriate ceremonies and activities. Now, therefore, we, by the County Commissioner's Court, do hereby proclaim November 2016 as Home Care and Hospice Month. And encourage the support and participation of all citizens in learning more about the home care and hospice philosophy of care for the elderly, <coughs> disabled, and the terminally ill. You can put this photo up. I had a parent who set my hand and thought this is your new fix, dated the 14th of day, November 2016. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think everybody in this room knows someone in their, in their life who has gone through something like this or who will soon do this. So I think this is very important. I'm going to sign this. Yes, you'll do. I move that we approve the Home Health Care Hospice Month proposition. Second. And a second on the table is right here. Point zero. Thank you very much. Get this signed. Uh, number six, Carter County Memorial Stadium sublease to consider an act of one approval of the sublease of Carter County Memorial Stadium. Andrew Dunn is here to talk about this. Andrew, you want to come up? Andrew, if you don't mind saying your name and your address, for the record, please. Andrew Dunn, 4015 Turnberry Circle, Houston, Texas. Uh, I'm here to discuss baseball in Amarillo. My name's Andrew Dunn. I own and operate the Pecos League. The Pecos League is an independent professional baseball league with 10 teams in California, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and Kansas. The league was founded in 2010. We've had 2,100 players play in the league since then. Two have made it to the major leagues. We have executed and agreed to a sublease with Southern Independent Baseball from the Metroplex, the sublease at Stadium, May, June, July, and keep independent professional baseball in Potter County. Our team will be a full-time Amarillo team and play a full schedule in our league. In addition to the Pecos League subleasing the stadium, the, the group in, in the Metroplex Southern Independent Baseball is 
subleasing in the spring to San Jacinto Christian Academy. In January to May, they lost their field and they will be playing or in the process of playing their schedule in Potter County Stadium. Between our organizations, um, we feel we can get Potter County back on track to the condition it needs to be in. Um, Bill Amarillo is a great city for the Pecos League for a lot of reasons. Um, it's a historic baseball town. Geographically, it's, it's close to Garden City, Santa Fe, Alpine, Roswell, and Trinidad, which is all places we have teams. I have no affiliation with any other team or organization that has been here in the past. We played every year here in spring training, opening games, and um, we're a total um, independent organization from, from any, anyone that's been here and played here before. So um, that's, that's what I'm here for, and um, answer any questions or whatever, you, whatever it is. I do have a little background. I have been speaking with Mr. Elliston, so I can certainly use this time to inform the court. Um, normally around this time every year, one of the items that we have contractually are the improvements that need to happen on that stadium. So at the end of the fiscal year, we have kind of a little small working committee that includes our county auditor, our legal counsel, facilities director, and we get the improvements that are submitted, and we kind of work through that, similar to what we did last year, and say, are these improvements? or are these just maintenance? <coughs> I think that's great or could go up for debate either way we bring to the full commissioner's board to debate that. So from a timeline perspective, I have been speaking with Mr. Elston. We've tried to put something on the calendar every couple of weeks just to touch base on where we are. Uh, they no longer have their existing general manager and so one of the logistical things we were working on is to get the keys back to the facility. That's, the, that's an item that's still open. And we also do not have the documented improvements. Um, we communicated that to him earlier uh, in the year and said, you know, the improvements are coming up, so get ready for that. We actually provided a date through the end of October, October 31st, to just kind of have that in and we'll start to reconvene as a committee. You will see in your backup, your packet for commissioner's court that we did get an item submitted and it is listed Potter County improvements, but I want to be very clear that none of this has been at all verified. This just came through late last week, and I think Judge Tanner and certainly I put everything in here so you have all the information of the open questions. None of this has been verified. Um, we typically ask for invoices to have for our documentation. So I just want to be very clear that the improvements are still very much an open item on, on Mr. Ellison's contract. His contract runs through September 30th of 2017, but we're trying to get these year improvements settled. Um, just so you kind of know the dollar of what we're trying to settle, when Ms. Tucker, who I know is in the audience with us today, was the general manager, you'll recall this time last year, she really did over and above on her improvements. The first year on the contract, they were only required to make 68,000 in the improvements, and again, we made that contract change so they don't pay us any dollars. It's the improvements that occur as a result of the agreement. 68,000 was the first year, but uh, she certainly went above that. So Carrie, keep me honest on these numbers, but what I have, what's due and owed for this year that we're trying to settle is roughly $12,181 and a little change, 82 cents. So that's the dollar amount we're trying to settle. This time last year, it was the 68,000. We were trying to get all that documentation. So this is what's left for this year to close that out. So the improvements are very much still an open question. Uh, Mr. Ellison, I had requested, certainly by Judge Tanner's request as well, for him to be present since he is currently the contract holder. He indicated he could not today and if the court felt we needed to pass this until he could he would be present at the next couple of agenda, uh, court sessions for a full agenda. So I wanted to report about the improvements. You also have in your packet an item that Ms. Tucker presented, which is an email expressing concern about some payables that are due. And I'll look to Scott to keep me honest here because the court, this is not in our purview. This is their business entity to business entity. So this is not in our purview to decide but I wanted to make sure you had all the information that we have been presented with about some payables. And Mr. Ellison is aware of that. I've made a call to him to let him know that certainly this is all presented in the court 
and I expect there to be audience <coughs> participation, so none of this would be a surprise to him. So the improvements I wanted to mention, Ms. Tucker's email, um, a small thing, and Mike, I'll look at you to keep me honest, but I was trying to get all of my items together to make sure the court was aware of everything. We did get a citation on the property about the weeds being overgrown was corrected, uh, but we did get a citation from the city. So, you know, that's kind of, it's a, a smaller item thing, but I just want to make sure the full court knows that. That is my update. I have, a, I have a question. Uh, there's some equipment that's uh, in the uh, facility that is not owned uh, by anybody that's at the ballpark. There's a gentleman out of Chicago that would like to get his equipment back or I guess he'd be willing to sell it. Uh, but uh, right now, the, the equipment belongs to another person. He's been waiting for over a year, and I thought this had been settled. He's, he's been getting tax. I know there's not that many years there. He's been getting tax tax bills on this and he doesn't have what, he can't that get it. It's a blue bonnet concession. Right. And he can't get it. No one will let him in to get it and he's paying he's paying taxes on this. So he's not happy. So we got a lot of um, a lot of talking to do about this. Well our, our the thing from a timeline I have ten cities so our schedule um and I came to Commissioner's Court in two thousand ten as well and at the time you guys elected to award the lease to this group and and here we are, but our schedule, um, our schedule, we have 10 other cities. I don't know our timeline, and I also don't know that with Mr. Elliston, I don't know Mr. Elliston at all, but from my talks with him, I don't know that he would come here. Uh, for, for, I mean, I don't know what you talk for. Yeah, so I don't know when and if he'd come here in the future, the fact that he doesn't have a team going forward. So I don't know, um, I don't know how that's gonna stand, but yeah, that's things to consider. I feel like my biggest question is why is Elliston still involved? With the lease. Uh, well, he's it's it's out of, if he's backing out of the teams, he's not, and having gone to some of the games last year and seen the position in the field, that we spent 42000 I think, on a concession stand and they served uh, cold hot dogs and, uh, and uh, the Frito pies. I don't think we got our investment back at all. But at the end of the season, the lead office contacted us and asked us, you know, what our interest would be in going to Joplin and Amarillo. And then they put us in touch with him and he, he, he executed the sub lease. So I don't know. That's not something I can answer. Yeah, it's nothing. Right. Sure. As far as I'm concerned, you could have it. But, uh, it uh, my biggest concern is what, why is he still involved? He shouldn't be, I don't think he should be involved at all. And we think he's defaulted on that lease. I think we can say the lease is over. So lease it to someone else. Typically, he hasn't defaulted, so to speak, because he is the, he is the leasee, but he leased it out to the ball team and um, to the people who were, who were running it. And, and they, they are the ones who basically do not come through. <coughs> That's his responsibility. Well, and um, just Shannon, I'll also mention, I mean, certainly we're excited about anything that could happen in that stadium. We, I mean, we know as a commissioner's court, we're, we will have to entertain a decision on what will happen with that property. So I think certainly don't take these contractual concerns to misstate that we're excited about something that could go in there. One thing to make a note on the sublease is that Part of the agreement between PECAS, at least the draft that we have in front of us, is that they would exchange $25,000 of improvements. So that would leave kind of $25,000 under Mr. Ellison's purview. Well, it's split between the, the high school and our the 50-50 tenants. And we don't we don't have a draft of anything from okay, the so high school. I'm not aware of that. I don't yeah. know what you have. Yeah, we, all, we just got the draft, right. uh, and there have been some questions a little bit on the term in just years. And so I know there's been discussions as okay. well for San Jacinto, which certainly back to Commissioner's Church point, I think we're excited about anything that could be in there. We don't have a draft. Um, there was a little concern even last week because I've heard that there's a website up and running and it has Potter County's logo. So I think the biggest concern was that someone could actually purchase the ticket right. um, without a lease being in effect that the commissioner's court has the ability to do. So I would just, for what it's worth, you know, just cause a state a little caution because I think right. there's a few missteps from a public perception. Sure. And we certainly don't want the public 
to be able to purchase tickets when indeed there is not an agreement in place. So that's just more of a cautionary. Right. Well, when, when I executed the sublease from him, I guess maybe he was under the interpretation it was a go forward. I didn't, I didn't, that was where there's confusion. So we, no, no, no way wanted to mislead anyone that there's a team, nor do we need to do it. We have 10 teams, we never sell tickets if, so. That's and, and Scott, um, keep me honest here on the contract because I think there's a little, ter a couple of terms here that I just want to make sure that I'm clear about. Um, Andrew mentioned executed an agreed upon lease between me and Mr. Ellison, but this commissioner's board has the authority for the sublease. There is no sublease in agreement until it comes to the commissioner's That's board. That's correct. If any sublease under the terms of the original lease agreement has to be approved by the commissioner's board. Okay. That, that, that was obviously where there's a point of confusion because from, from the <laughs> My understanding in our, our lease, when we have a lease, we move forward. We have sure. a lease, we move forward. We didn't, you know, miss violate by launching a website or whatever. That's part of our work baseball. We, we get our schedules ready for the other team. So that's been removed and things, you know, the, the logo was removed and, you know, the boots, everything. You know, so it is what it is. And, and definitely we're, we're, we're getting off to the wrong foot all the way around. And, and, and we want to just um, get things correct to move forward. So that's. I would, I would suggest, Judge, and entertain that we maybe hold this item until Mr. Ellison is present and we can address these contracted items directly with him. Is it necessary? Do we, do we know of any of these improvements that are listed in the I've never seen them. Just that. Just that. Yeah. 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 Stephanie, do you want to say anything today? No? Okay. <laughs> Is there anybody else who would like to say anything to the in public here that wants to speak on this matter? No one? Okay. Andrew, we appreciate you being here yes. this morning. Uh, hopefully we get something done. Yeah. So we're just going to wait for two weeks to see if we get any jobs in here. I would, I would suggest that. So if he doesn't make it, what are we going to do? Ted, did you have something to Well, to be clear, the sublease does not release. The less the original lesson. Yeah. Okay, so you still want it? That's correct. That's correct. So that's, so that's, that's why Ellison and his security were involved because they remain viable on their commitment. This sentence is not a thing. Okay. Let's pass it for two weeks and see what we can hear. And I'll leave the call to him with the Andrew, thank you for coming at the end. Okay. All right, number seven. Tiers number two to receive a report from the city of Amarillo regarding tiers number two and consider an act of the county's participation in tier number two. City of Amarillo. Judges, commissioners, thank you for allowing us to come and to. Uh, brief you on the creation of the second tiers in the city of Amarillo. Uh, the uh, tiers is located on East I-40, uh, basically between uh, Lakeside and Eastern, the northern side of uh, I-40. The primary purpose for creating the tiers is to capture uh, development an incremental tax increase to fund a multi-court uh, athletic facility to be uh, used by our Parks and Recreation Department and to promote uh, uh, tournaments into the community, which is an economic development driving force. Uh, this is an important project to the community, and uh, we want to brief you on the particulars related to this, be able to answer any questions with a subsequent request that you participate in the uh, uh, the tiers in terms of uh, the increment, as well as having representation on the uh, board of directors for it. I'm going to call on uh, Deputy City Manager Bob Cow, who has been the team leader for uh, developing this uh, tiers. Uh, to come and make a presentation to the commission's court. Uh, I have a 10 a.m. meeting involving some of uh, my elected officials. So the discussion goes uh, uh, beyond that point. I'll need to excuse myself. 
it doesn't say that we're not vitally interested uh, in this project. Uh, the, uh, so I'm going to call on, on, on Bob Cow to uh, uh, present this to you. Uh, would love to answer any questions or additional information as a result of uh, making uh, this request uh, to the Commissioner of Schools. Thank you. Good morning, Lane. Thank you for the opportunity. I think, I think you all have copies, hopefully, of, of the presentation. And I've got, I've got a couple more as well here, if anybody wants, um, wants those. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to present the, uh, the information. I'll be very brief. Uh, I know some of you have been familiar with going through the tax increment reinvestment zone process previously with, um, with the city and ultimately what we're hoping to secure from uh, the county, from the Panhandle Groundwater Conservation District and Amarillo College is participation in tiers number two, equivalent to what we received in participation in tiers uh, number one. Um, just by uh, way of comparison, tiers number one in roughly the 10 years that we've had a partnership with those same entities um, has added about $52 million worth of value um, into our community. So um, by most measures, uh, we consider that, and hopefully you all do here as well, tiers number one a, a great success and it's 10 years into its 30 year life. And just as a reminder, participation by the county in that tiers is for 30 years at 100% of the increment. And ultimately, that's what we're hoping to be able to secure um, as we go forward with tiers number one as well. Bob, can I ask a question sure. there if I may? The 52 million, the increase in tiers number one, um, I'm assuming that's total, mm -hmm. total project scope, it, or is that the dollar amount that will then be taxable? To Potter County because there's certainly a, a, quite a few government right, that, facilities. That's that the people. that's the value of, okay. um, of the construction, and actually that does not currently include the three projects that are under construction. So those are the it was 140 million dollar base, and as of last year we were at 192 million of taxable value. Um, is, is what that what that covers. Okay. So yes, there's actually quite a bit more development beyond that as well. It's just those pieces are taxable. <coughs> Good, good question. Um, basically, the, this tier, as Terry indicated, um, is the, about uh, 900 acres um, between um, Lakeside or the Loop and Eastern, and then up to Third and then I-40 North I-40. Um, most of the area is currently vacant. Um, most of it is currently underserved by utilities. Um, so I always have to add my little asterisk to what Terry's um, uh, comments are in that. Um, Terry is correct. One of the significant benefits of going through this tax increment reinvestment zone process will yield this athletic facility that we discussed. I'll talk a little bit about what the plans are in terms of what that is and the financing of it. Um, but the primary, um, at least initial reason to do the tiers is actually to secure funds to actually reimburse the city for the extension of utilities that need to go in the area. Utilities that um, either are not typically the responsibility of the city or are the responsibility of the city, but need to come online faster than what they might otherwise do. Those would include things like extension of water and wastewater um, facilities, as well as dealing with uh, drainage and streets. Um, all of those would be public facilities, and again, would be items that we would typically construct in an area for development, but that typically might take 10, 15, 20 years to do. Um, in this case, we're trying to construct as many of those as we can in the first five, 10 years of the, of the project. And so setting up a mechanism by which we can actually ensure that we get those dollars back in order to do that is a key part of it. And then of course the ability to actually generate enough cash flow to be able to um, service a debt payment associated with the athletic facility. Um, right now the assumptions that we're working under, and I had to be careful when I presented this to council to make sure everybody understood, these are assumptions. This is just a financial model. Um, we, there are only a couple of things we're assured of through this process, but the model right now is assuming about $100 million worth of investment um, over those next 30 years. Ideally, the majority of which is coming in the first 10 years, um, that $100 million worth of investment yields enough money to be able to support about $10 million worth of infrastructure improvements in the area. We probably have somewhere around $15 million, if not more, of infrastructure improvements, but the tiers itself could support about 10 million of those. And it would have enough uh, dollars to support about a 12 to $15 million recreation facility and it would have enough dollars to put about two million roughly into what I'm referring to as kind of aesthetic improvements. 
Um, those would be improvements at kind of the gateway. So if you imagine where the loop and I-40 are, those, those could go into um, things like landscaping or decorative signage or lighting or what have you um, throughout the district to kind of give it uh, a little bit more identity than perhaps it has currently. So that $100 million worth of investment would yield that type of, those types of projects um, as we move, move forward. Ask a question. Sure. The, the 10 million of infrastructure improvements. Can you give a few examples of what Yeah, you're most of that are uh, street extensions and um, water and wastewater and then drainage again. Drainage is probably the most expensive improvement in the area. It's a very, very flat piece of property. And under city code, while the developer is responsible for managing stormwater inside their project, once they get it to a city street, then the city actually is responsible for managing it beyond that. And typically, we're spending somewhere between a million and two million dollars a mile to be able to manage that kind of stormwater, and so that's a significant uh, cost. And I would say streets is the, are the second most extensive uh, cost in there, and those would be extensions of streets like Whitaker through the area, as well as a couple of the other streets to try to create some internal circulation, so that there's some relief on the front road in that area. Um, the uh, the way that we've got the Proforma built is the um, uh, the model has it such that there would be some initial uh, increment this is the only piece that we have some assurance of right now which is there are two hotels under construction currently with our adoption of the tiers in november of this year when those hotels come on the tax rolls that increment will be captured based on whatever the participating levels are so that's basically the only dollar we know for certain will be coming into the tiers everything else to that after that is obviously speculative based in, in the model but the idea is if the, um, the first increments, so for example, if the Big Texan restaurant relocates to this, to this area and um, builds a new restaurant as is proposed, then, and that would happen in the first couple of years, and if, for example, the RV park is relocated and reconstructed, and that happens within the first couple of years, then those values would get captured early in the process. Based on the model, we think somewhere around year four or five, there would be enough cash flow coming off of the property to sustain the debt necessary to actually construct the athletic facility. We need about a million dollars, just shy, shy, just shy of a million dollars worth of tax revenue each year to be able to sustain that $15 million worth of, of debt over the rest of the, um, of the life of the tiers. Now, obviously, the way we're proposing it, we, the way we proposed it to council is that we would not issue that debt until that cash flow was su sufficient to sustain it. So. Um, again, our model right now is saying year four to five. Um, if development goes faster, that could be year two or three. If development goes slower, that could be year seven, eight, nine, or ten. Um, the key piece of getting the athletic facility in, obviously, is meeting a, a need in the community um, for those types of facilities. But as, as Terry mentioned, it also generates the opportunity to be able to host tournaments. And the hosting of those tournaments, in turn, will bring folks closer to where the restaurants are that are located in that area, and hopefully the hotels as well, which in turn stimulates additional economic growth. So that's, that's why some economic growth will generate enough dollars to actually construct the facility. The construction and operation of the facility itself will generate additional economic activity, which will generate additional uh, revenue is the, is the plan with it. But again, um, right now our plan is not to proceed until we can actually cash flow that we don't want to advance. Um, funded without some assurance that we know those, those dollars are coming forward. Um, the council. Well, uh, you may, as soon as I'm asking this question, I think you're getting ready to say this. I know this has already had a couple of initial discussion points at the council. What has the general feel? Yeah, the, the council had it actually was exactly where I was going to go, so thank you. Um, the, the council actually had a series of first executive sessions ultimately because of the incentives involved and then um, had a couple of workshops and then two public hearings and then ultimately on uh, last week actually on November 8th they have their second reading approved the establishment of the tax increment reinvestment zone um, so what and it's been all very positive was a unanimous decision by by the council what that means is what the council has done is they have um, identified the boundaries of the tiers they have established a name which is the east gateway tiers number two it's number two of course because we already have one the tiers <coughs> They have um, established a fund. The fund basically is meaning that's where the dollars that are collected by whomever participates um, goes into, into those funds. And they established the, uh, the board. It's a nine member board. And by statute, there are members from each of the taxing, the local taxing entities, um, except for the city. So uh, Amarillo College, Panhandle Groundwater Conservation District, Potter County, and AISD are participating members, just as we have on uh, tiers number one. 
unless, of course, any of those entities wish to forego participation. And no one has in tiers number one, but say, for example, that Emerald Independent School District didn't want to participate, then they would not, not, they would not nominate a board member, in which case then the council would have another appointment. So that would take up four of those appointments. The other five are city council appointments. So those four are actually appointed by those bodies, just as you do for tiers number one. Um, the other five will come from the city council. The main uh, impact, there are two impacts with that action taken by the, uh, the council. The first was, it, again, it, it establishes the base value, which is roughly $43,560,000 uh, $43, out in that area. The reason that's important is any growth, whether that's growth due to um, reassessment or new development, now will be um, built upon that $43 million. So that's now established by the action the council took. The second, prior, uh, second important thing that allowed us to do is to, to do this, to come to you all. Um, next week, I'll be presenting to AISD, and then later this month, we'll be presenting to um, uh, Emerald College Board Trustees, and then next month, the Panhandle Groundwater Conservation District. And again, the purpose for these meetings is to kind of help explain and answer questions about the tiers, as well as to um, request your participation in the tax increment reinvestment zone at the same levels that you participated in tiers number one. So that, that is my kind of overview of it. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you all might have about it. Is it, is it by statute that uh, the school district does not participate financially? Yes, the uh, Texas, early on in the establishment of TIFs really across the country, school districts were a primary participant. And the main reason is they bought the most dollars, obviously. Um, most states in Texas certainly is one of those shifted away from that long ago to where they actually um, no longer are able to participate. They have a spot on the board, but they're no longer able to financially participate in the increments. Um, the advantage to the school districts of that is if we realize that $100 million worth of investment, the portion of their tax revenue that's being presumably created by virtue of those tiers existing, they get. Um, so they'll pass on through the school district. The rest of the participating entities won't realize that until 30 years, until one of the other tiers expires. But uh, yes, that is statutorily um, controlled. Um, Clark County, as is to, in tiers one, is the largest uh, financial support. And so, that's yeah, they did. Hopefully, you all understand that. So. Yeah, just to, to give some numbers behind that, because um, I know the uh, inside the preliminary um, project and financing plan, there's no way it would be possible to read the chart that's in there. So I know I sent another slightly enlarged version, but if I did my math correct, and again, this is based off that model, if we got $100 million worth of development and we saw the increment realized over a 30 year period, that represents about $18 million worth of, of revenue coming from Potter County, and it's about $10 million coming from the city of Monroe. So, Together, we're the two largest contributors to that um, to that reinvestment zone. And so, thirty-year period. That's great. That's great. And Judge, I'll add a couple of comments here. I know that we have the Lee family in the audience, which is certainly incremental to instrumental to this establishment. So, obviously, no surprise. It's quite exciting for a hundred million dollars of development to be on the table for Potter County. So that, in and of itself, kind of enough said at that point. But I've been working with the Lee family over the year, as I heard in the community about this type of development. So I certainly don't want to put Bobby Lee on the spot, but if you would like to say something, please feel free to do so. I wanted to share a little bit of the context of what I understand will go in this Eastgate um, tier zone. And I think all of this is still may shift a little bit, so nothing is really set in stone, but there are discussions regarding, um, obviously, the big Texan move, kind of being the pioneer um, shift for that area. Also discussions around new hotels, restaurants, this athletic facility, hockey, football, you name it. Everything's kind of been on the table because of the footprint of this land. So I think that's quite exciting. You know, we ran into a few bumps at the beginning of the first tiers because the land was landlocked, obviously, and we had to move the tenants. Um, I don't expect that to be the case in this Eastgate tiers. Uh, but I know there's been a lot of dialogue and discussion of what this could be. I think the great thing is that there are still quite a few things on the table of what it could ultimately turn into. But the most exciting part that I feel like for Potter County and the taxpayers is in 30 years, this will be tax taxable private dollars that then the taxpayers could profit from. Um, and no surprise, a part of town that quite honestly, I don't know that I'll ever see again in my lifetime. So I'm quite excited 
that this could potentially really unfold and um, certainly is before us as a commissioner's court in Potter County. Bobby, I'm not sure if you want to add anything to that because I certainly don't want to speak for the scope of, of the project. I don't think I could follow that. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, Judge, just in terms of a, a logistical item, I did meet with our county auditor uh, and prep for this item, as we all do, and said, what are we missing? Is this good, bad? What are we forgetting? And so I, I certainly don't want to speak for you either, Carrie, but I got a green light that this it looks fine. Um, so I wanted to share that with the court. What, what is going to be our investment? I think based on that model, again, you know, I'm always cautious to say I'm a model, but we received that $100 million worth of investment in an increment that was captured over 30 years that represents from the county about $18 million um, is what, what I would expect off that. Now again, if we get $200 million is twice that, but that would be outstanding. We have that type of development. If we get less development, that would be less of a, of a commitment. Based off that model of $100 million investment, it's about $18 million worth of investment. And again, it's about $10 million coming from the city and then others will be coming from the other taxing entities. If they so it'll be over the increase of what is um, slated. That's correct. The base tax revenue coming off that $43 million, of course, will continue to flow through to the county and to the other taxing entities as well. Yes, that's correct. That's correct. And, and we do have the authority to do less than 100%, but it's up to us. Yes, that, that, that is correct. And, and of course, all the sales tax and hotel occupancy taxes generating this will continue to flow through the taxing entities as well as, as it currently does. I am excited about this. I think it's a really good thing for that part of town. Um, do you think we're yeah. and, um, uh, I think it's I think it's a really good step forward for the county and for the city. So follow that with a motion. I make a motion to approve tiers number two. East Gateway Tiers at 100% for 30 years. I have a motion and a second. All in favor, raise your hand. I appreciate it very much. Thank, thank you, um, Commissioner Support. I also want to thank the county attorney for helping us get the, the language we needed as we uh, proceed from this. So thank, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Judge, Commissioners, thank you very much. Great thank partnership you. here. Thank you. It is. Thank you. Thank you, thank you sir. For your vision. Be happy with you. Okay. Okay. Number eight: to District and County Code Software to consider and approve an amendment to Power Technologies contract to convert from annual to quarterly billing for maintenance and support services. Who wants to speak to this? Anybody? Oh, come. <laughs> So the district and county clerks are currently transitioning over into Tyler's Odyssey product and their maintenance and service agreement is due and we would like to amend the contract to pay it quarterly um, in an effort just to hold Tyler Technologies a little bit more accountable as we go through this process. That's the only change. That's the only change. Carrie, we want a timing issue. That was my only question. A timing issue for this type of payment for schedule change. No, but actually, this first year maintenance was included in the budget we could purchase. So okay. And Jason. <clears throat> okay. I move we approve the uh, amendment to the contract with the Tyler Technologies. Yes, please. Second. For motion and a second, all in favor, raise your hand. And zero, thank you, Mary. Number nine, fire department equipment contract to consider and approve an exchange program agreement with Avon Protection Services Inc. for provision, maintenance, and compliance <coughs> of firefighting equipment. Good morning. Good morning. How are y'all? I know you can't have on. Yes. I didn't think about coming up with a ding dong joke, but I guess I did. <laughs> Towards the end of September, um, Avon bought, we use ISI as what we refer to them as for our ACBAs, our breathing air apparatus, for when we fight structure fires, car fires, trash fires, other things, other places that we worry about the air that we're breathing and what's in it. Uh, Avon has bought them several years ago. We were approached by them in the latter part of September. 
with an offer that I kind of look at it as a lease purchase agreement, um, wherein they will provide us all new equipment and they will provide all the service and the annual certification of all the equipment that goes with it. Right now, um, the total cost, and then we have currently have 64 uh, pieces of SCBA equipment. We're going to trade them 19. We have our equipment ranges over several generations of their of their air packs. The older generations were all similar in operation. It wasn't a big trading issue for us. There were differences and improvements, but not major. The newest version that they've come out with because of NMPA guidelines and changes have made some more major changes to them. And there's a little difference in the operation. It's, we like them, we plan to keep on using them, but uh, it is making a little more training problem for us as we're gonna go forward through the years to do this. What this allows us to do is to get all new equipment at one time and take care of our maintenance and everything else with it. Uh, we were a little, we are a little skeptical in the fire department over warranty work because we found generally that warranty means that when it breaks, we only both halves. Um, their contract on this is pretty solid. <laughs> and what they say in the contract that they're going to take care of uh, about the only thing they exclude is if somebody purposely breaks a piece of equipment or if we get it chemically damaged. About the only way we should get one chemically damaged is if we're working in a hazmat, and usually in that case, almost always in that case, somebody else is responsible for paying for damages that we incur out of that operation. So we feel real good about this, this offer they've made to us. We looked at the cost. The cost for the first year is $78,000 roughly plus a $37,000 down payment and then it's seventy-eight thousand dollars a year for the first five years and then sixteen thousand dollars a year for the five years after that if we go for the whole contract at the end of the time we own the equipment uh, we're seeing about a 15 year life expectancy out of this equipment so that means we should get five more years to be able to continue to use what we've gone through the first time this year um, in our budget, we have $40,000 to buy new uh, bottles for our SCBAs. That will be put against this uh, proposal if we do it. We have $25,000 in our SCBA account that takes care of testing, uh, service, and then our testing and service on our compressors all comes out of that account. So what we're proposing is to take $20,000 of that and put it against this agreement. That with the trade-in that they're giving us means that for right now we need $31,000, a little more, um, to be able to start the first year of this operation. <coughs> and where are you proposing that account coming from? We talked to Carrie about this before we ever started. <laughs> um, we, all do that. <laughs> we, got, we got hit with this. Well, after budget, we didn't know they were doing anything about it. It is a beta program that they're doing. It's the way they phrased it to us. And it's not a spot I like to be all the time, but we are getting ready to be the first. If we do this, we're going to be the first ones in the program. Um, one of the things we questioned in a conference call that we had with them, I said, this is starting. What if it turns out you don't like this? And their response was, we are contractually telling you we're going to do this for the next five or 10 years at our option. No, so the this company has been in business. Do you have any background on the company? And, uh, um, like that? No. <laughs> Avon ISI, I know it's been around. We've been using ISI equipment for 20, 25 years. That we've had their air packs. Avon bought them, they're a larger company but I don't know how long they've been in existence. No, sir. Many, many years. They're not related to the other a I do know that because we asked them once. I'd be kind of interested to see how long they've been in business and if there have been any issues with them. 
we have we have had no issues with them. We have had issues. We kind of feel like part of the reason that they might have come to us is number one, they said they were looking for departments that are too large. We're looking for some small departments and some medium-sized departments. We fall into that medium size. Their equipment in the past we have had problems with. Uh, they'll issue a new uh, version of, of an air pack. We usually end up with them fairly soon on, and we've had various problems with them over the years. They have been very good about fixing the problems, and they know that we're not hesitant to let them know quite adamantly when we've got problems with what they're putting out. Uh, they take care of their problems. They've got a good reputation with that for us. Uh, one version of their air packs has a problem with the batteries. They have batteries in them, and the batteries don't last anywhere near what they said they would. Their solution to it is every quarter, we get a case of batteries from them that they send us. So the battery problem where we were replacing them quite regularly, and they took care of that expense for us. So we are happy with the way that they take care of what goes on. So I'm doing just a little head looking here on their website. They also offer law enforcement. And I don't know, Sheriff, if you have an opinion on this company. Maybe you don't know anything about it. But okay. Is it the same one they've been? No, I don't see anything, which makes me nervous that's not on there. <laughs> they bought ISI. They bought ISI several years ago. They've been it was a transition in the name. They were ISI Avon for a while and now they've gone to being just pure and then it was Avon ISI and now it's just gone to being straight Avon. So the only the only drawback that, that I see you have is that right now this this year's budget you have how much money in there for this there for you? We're actually putting in sixty thousand sixty thousand dollars out of our current budget money. We'll go against that seventy eight. Okay. So but, but every year after we're going to have to increase your budget in that to cover this. Yes, ma'am. Now next year, we know that we're going to have to come back for forty thousand dollars for more for the uh, other half of the bottles that are going that are expiring next year. We also have that same twenty thousand dollars that we're going to put in that will not be in our budget anymore. And that twenty thousand dollars, if it didn't have to increase applies all the way through the end of the contract. So in effect, I think that makes next year be 18,000 and after that it takes it down to 58 for the first five and then it's actually 4,000 back, but for the last five. And are they um, partnering with other counties? I mean, I would agree with your hesitancy about being the beta and being the first. I mean, in an ideal world, you know, if they had a few other counties under their belt and we had the opportunity um, <coughs> to look back and see how this really works from a financial breakdown, that would be ideal. But I don't know if, I mean, are you feeling an immediate need to do this now or are you thinking, let's think yeah. about it? The only thing that puts us in any, any kind of situation right now is we have to do annual testing on our SCBAs. That annual testing was due by the end of October. And we have it, that's about probably $9,000 to $10,000 worth of our budget goes to that. If we do this, we don't need to do that. And so if we're going to be able to execute this now, then we avoid that expense. And where did you mention the $31,000 coming from? You mentioned it, but I don't know. If it comes from cap, I believe, carries some capital. Right. Or, you can take it from contingencies or place in the general fund or uh, capital projects fund. There is a little bit of it. How did the contact come, come about? Did you contact the company or they? No, the company? no sir. Uh, our local company, uh, we deal through Panhandle Breathing Air Services, is the dealer, distributor, whatever for them here that we do business with all the time. He told us about it. We said, sure, we'll look at it. And their uh, sales guy came in and talked to us one day and made a presentation to us on it. I had no idea that they were doing this. So is this a better product in your opinion? It's a better product? Uh, it's the same product if, as we have, we have to start replacing this equipment because a lot of it's old. It's the same thing that we will buy to replace it with this one. Uh, you, you just get to replace them all at the same time. We get to replace them all at the same time. It spreads that cost out over a few years. 
Uh, Carrie looked at it and she agrees with what their paperwork said. There is a slight savings for the county on it. Um, the advantage to us is instead of replacing four or eight a year on it, so we replace a district probably is what we try to do something along that line instead of doing that to where we've got two different kind of SCBAs, basic SCBAs out there that we have to train everybody on. When we do this, we'll still just have one. So if we get everybody retrained, it'll work very smoothly for them. Carrie, what's your opinion? This is very new, new thinking. Oh, that has passed is long-term a slight financial advantage to the thing that uh, it does smooth out the budgeting instead of having a few years of a high budget to actually replace the projected because of the back budget. But the point about that you might believe the point is just I don't know how it is a concern. I believe they've been I believe Avon's been in business a very long time on this one three. Do I get your own? He has a revenue on the side. He left his own. He found a review. <laughs> oh, they've only been in business since 1885. 1885? 1885. Probably not. I think he actually won the world in 1885. They bought ISI in 2005. So they have a revenue. Contingency that we we have money in there. Yes. I know that we approved the exchange program agreement with the <coughs> services and uh, thirty-one thousand. And it's just exact figure. It's not exact. Thirty-one six thirteen thirty. I believe so. Yes. We hope not. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. We keep this posted since it's new. Yes, ma'am. I will. They told us it'll be four to five weeks, or six weeks to get the equipment. Just a quick agenda item yes. to keep us because that's very new. Sure will. Thank you. Okay. Number 10, resolutions key legislative issues to consider and act upon three key issues that will be addressed by the Texas legislature during the 2017 sessions. Mr. Church. Okay, let me just give you a little background on this. I uh, attended the Texas Judges and Commissioners uh, Association meeting down in uh, Galveston the 1st of October and uh, of course our Association's legal counsel is Jim Allison, and uh, he's also our uh, lobbyist in the legislature. And these are three resolutions that he had brought to everyone and wanted us to uh, to consider passing them and then uh, sending them on to our legislators as well as the governor and the Speaker of the House and Kenka and himself as well. So in, at that time, of the 254 counties that we have here in Texas, only 60 had responded. And so he encouraged us, if we could, bring it back and, and see if we could get the support of our county commission. And the three issues are uh, state funding for uh, indigent criminal defense. Uh, the second one was opposition to appraisal caps and revenue caps. And the third one is opposition to unfunded mandates. Um, just a short uh, discussion on each one of those before we start making any kind of uh, decisions. On these uh, indigent funds, you've got a, uh, some backup information and it shows where the, ex how the expenses for indigent uh, criminal defense has gone up. The Defense Act, uh, excuse me, the Fair Defense Act in 01 established that the state would help pay for that. And 
their contributions since uh, 02, they started out paying toward this throughout the state, 7.3 million. Last year they paid, uh, or they contributed 28.6 million, while the counties have contributed $209 million. So what this resolution or what the uh, legislation is asking is that uh, the state pitch in more of that contribution. So that's what that first one is. The opposition to appraisal caps and revenue caps, um, there's a movement by the by a senator from Houston and uh, the lieutenant governor to cap appraisals and revenue. We already have a cap at 8% of the effective tax rate. And what that means is if we go over 8, uh, over 8%, then there can be an election to to make this go back to uh, last year's. What they want to do is drop it to four or five percent. And so this this opposition is to tell them that you know we are facing many expenses that uh, that the legislature has passed down on us, and uh, they can help us by not passing this, but by relieving some of those expenses that, that they've passed to the county. So anyway, it's opposition to that appraisal cap and the revenue caps. Um, we had a legislative panel and some of the folks on there thought it'd probably get out of the Senate, but uh, we're hopeful that maybe the House will stop it. But anyway, we need to let people know what our feeling is on that. And I see where the uh, city just passed a similar uh, resolution in, to oppose that tax or that uh, cap. And then the final one is opposition to unfunded mandates. And we've talked about this every year at every meeting we've ever gone to as a county commissioner or county judge. And um, and so this this whole um, resolution just is saying. We would, we would like you to take over those unfunded mandates, but don't give us any more. Yeah. And it's also asking to have a, a constitutional amendment to take out the people to vote uh, uh, whether or not to eliminate unfunded mandates from the state. So those are the three resolutions. I didn't want to read them all word for word. You've had it in front of you. And I would move that we approve the three resolutions as presented. Second. Any discussion? Thank you for very good. I appreciate that. No. Okay, we have a motion and a second. In favor, raise your hand. Go to see. I will sign these and give them to the people who are designated. downtown parking control to provide a parking control automation update via the interlocal parking garage screen of the um, so I have a quick presentation and Brandon if you'll just kind of roll through I'm interested in maybe page 10 11 those kind of things I just wanted to give you a quick update because we do have an interlocal agreement with the city of Amarillo and, and the LGC being that umbrella <laughs> So the project is moving along. They're at now 50% completion. So one of the things you'll start to see on our payables once we get documentation of that is that second wave of the payment coming through. So that's just a small logistical item. But Mike attended a meeting with me, and what we wanted to do was commit to you as a commissioner's court that as we have these meetings and these updates that we bring this back to you so you know some items up for discussion. But maybe if you'll, um, Brandon, if you'll stop maybe on page 10 for me, if you don't mind. So one of the things that the city is looking at is what is the vendor, who is the vendor that they are gonna be using, they're down to the final two. I confirmed with Mr. Cal this morning that this is okay to share, this, this is who they will, and they are already recommended as the vendor. But they're doing a lot of, um, I might call it technology infrastructure reviews 
And this was actually a recommendation of Russ Simpson at the LGC meeting and said, should someone let Potter County see this? And they have 150 spots and they've paid into this. So just in case they have input, what would that be? And make sure we're prepping for that. So certainly um, me and I am not the expert and I asked Mike to attend and he did. And so they shared with us a couple of items that they have projected of what's the equipment that will go in. To be very clear, this is not the vendor or the process of who's gonna operate it. This is just the infrastructure of what's gonna go in. I had a lot of questions about um, real-time access, whether it was on someone's cell phone so they could see there's three spots on floor two or five spots on um, floor four. We had a lot of discussion about Potter County and how would our spots be, be designated because we, we paid for them, I wanna say from eight to five. Don't quote me on that time, but I think we paid, we, the formula is based on hours, not the whole day because we only need it during the work day. So uh, we had an interest to make sure what that equipment was like. They, we talked a little bit about um, a barcode of some type. And so one of the things we as a commissioner's court will at some point have to decide how do we want to use those 150 spots? Is that for employees to park there so that we have frontline parking ready for those doing business with the county? Or are we saying um, to the citizens to use those parking spots? So there's some operational things we have to talk through. But the good news that I heard at this meeting is there is, um, I'll call it like a key card. I, I know that's not what it is, but a key card of some type that the city has the ability to print and that those can be part of counties. So I'm not expecting that we have to go buy something to print it so that we know which spots are ours. But this is still very early discussions. Mike attended. Mike, if there's something you'd like to add as a result of that meeting. I think one of the interesting things was who are the jurors, the validation that they would have the jurors or any contractor uh, through this uh, system, the juror will go pick up their ticket they would take it to the district clerk. They would validate that they were actually there for jury duty to it's not abused. They would take the ticket back and go meet that. We have a very critical element. Like Commissioner McGee has said on the HID, uh, that's a card reader for the employees that the employees could utilize uh, to get in and out of the gate. And then the RFID was actually a little bigger uh, bid system, uh, contractors, they would utilize this. Anytime they have an event where after business hours, they would have the actual garage staff, people would be working out into the streets. Uh, they had the capability to, uh, where you enter into this parking garage, they would become excellent to get people out of the complex. So city's done a lot of good work in research on this, how this would work. One of the items that caught my attention at that meeting, Mike, too, is the ability for a monitor. So let's say Brandon's checking out of the parking garage and his debit card isn't working or he has a problem. Um, someone is on call, so they're already kind of thinking through these operational things and you have the ability to you know, click help. And someone, like a face, would open the other end and, and say, can I help you? You know, what happened? That kind of thing. So some of these are still not 100% locked in. Um, there are some add-on features. One of the items that I will be asking the LGC to look at is a marketing opportunity to sell some of this. Let's say there's burgers two for one down the street. They could sell that to generate new revenue to pay for some of these add-on technology features. I remember when we started this conversation at the LGC, the underlying goal was this would be the parking garage of the future. So no big surprise, we're looking for true technology to really make it that. And Bob, I, I just noticed you're still in the audience. Would you like to add anything to that? No, thank you. Okay. So this is just a quick update. And instead of um, you know us forming another committee, and if, if everybody's okay, my, as Mike and I keep meeting with them, we'll bring this back to the commissioners to keep everyone in the loop. Caroline, I have one question for you. On any given day, how many jurors do you summons? Uh, we summons about 600. 600. Uh -huh. um, we probably show up. Probably the most we've ever had is probably 225. So that parking garage is won't even, won't even accommodate them. Mm -hmm. But that's on Monday. That's for them. <coughs> we'll see. And we still have, uh, you know, the district court's property judge. And when we 
when we passed this, this was still with the sheriff's admin where it currently is. So when that project finishes, that will free up a lot of that parking, um, like that need, I guess that employee need won't be there to park anymore too. So more to come, but we just wanted to make sure the court was informed. Okay, thank you. Number 12, IT memorandum, uh, understanding to consider an active form of the memorandum of understanding between Texas A&M and this is just a uh, renewal. This is just a renewal of our IT service agreement. Just a renewal. Just you waited yes. all that time right. just to renew. Just to renew. I'm sorry. It's every it's two something. years. <laughs> I apologize. I kind of slipped through our fingers. Yes. So we just request the signature, Jay. Thank you. Thank you. I think a motion to good. Make a motion to approve a memorandum of understanding between Texas and in AgriLife and Potter County for IT services. Sure. I have a motion and a second. I'll pay you raise your hand. Zero, thank you. My own copy. Number 13, Neighborhood Planning Committee to provide an update on the city county neighborhood planning process. Uh, this will be very quick, Judge. I didn't actually have this originally slated for an update, but I was watching the um, city uh, meeting online, so that's out there in case anybody likes to go listen to the meeting as are ours. But um, this came up as a result of our neighborhood project with the North Heights, and so I thought this was a good way to just bring this back to the commissioners' court. Um, there is a pack in your packet is this North Hughes pedestrian crossing. So the short version of it is that this group has been meeting in the North Heights and this neighborhood initiative is kind of the pioneer for that. That's Potter County participating, the city. So now this group has been uh, meeting for well over a year, almost a year now. They have their final meeting next Monday at 530 where the project, um, the whole scope, uh, the development plan will be unveiled at that meeting. But this I thought was kind of just a quick, interesting thing to share with the court because one of the items that was discovered at that meeting was some crosswalk signage and some pedestrian traffic and how to make sure that people are safe as they're crossing the area. So I thought it was something we don't traditionally talk about. We talk about alleys and lights and sidewalks and development. Um, I know I don't necessarily just think of the crossing uh, initiative. So uh, the long and short of this is that this uh, will, there was discussion at the city that this might come from our funds because we participated in this but I think the city has landed that it will come from their red light camera funds. So this will not actually come from us, but I think the important takeaway is that this whole committee is what kind of spurred that dialogue. There's additional visibility and additional dialogue added to that. So I thought it was something different that we don't necessarily think <coughs> comes out of these meetings. And Bob, that's my only update on Kevin D. Yeah, the important thing is the Monday evening meeting as well, but the neighborhood kind of concludes their work, so thank you. 530. And what's the location for that? It's back at Cultural Center. Cultural Center. Okay. Number 14, court agenda items to consider an action plan update the process used to the agenda items. I'll be quick on this as well, Judge. Um, and Shannon, you may, maybe you should come talk. Let's get you up here. Uh, this is just a, an item for just quick discussion. We don't have to take action on this today, but how the idea came up, I, I learned from one of our city council members that when they publish their agenda, they actually publish all the backup that goes with it too. So no big surprise, there's lots of paper even just here on our table. I'm not advocating that we get rid of our packets because I know that you've got to take them and work through them throughout the weekend and prep and all that. So I'm not advocating for this. The only item that I'm suggesting, I know that it's very helpful on the city side to get all the backup that goes with it. And I would imagine as we increase our transparency efforts, if we have an ability to include the backup with our agenda online, we have to work through that a little bit logistically with IT and with Shannon, but I heard she was excited about it. So that made me excited about it. Is that a fair statement? That's fair. Okay. I, I don't mind. I mean, I'm assuming we just scan everything together it goes on the website. Mm -hmm. that yeah, that, that's it. Um, and then we, I know that there's several department heads in here that actually get a packet 
And if you would still request that you want to pack it for whatever reason that be, I think we're still willing to do that. But if there's some that say, send it to me online, it'll be online, then that's fine too. So that, and we just thought, we almost just did it, and good thing Judge Tanner kept me along here. Uh, she said, we probably need to bring this to Commissioner's Court just to know that it's an idea. Um, and again, the idea with those in the public that do go online to print the agendas and are trying to follow what happens, that's really the original intent. Is there any concern about that? We're so not used to as long as we don't have to print one. Yeah. yeah. We yeah. are right here. It would be less. And endanger a lot of trees. Yeah. yeah. And we killed a couple of trees today. Would you be okay with something like that, you think? Okay. So we can take that as a to do and, and you know bring that back to the court so everyone is aware. I don't mind our one today. Do we need action? I don't know if we need action, Pat. If you're going to implement it as formal policy for how things are submitted, okay. yes. And it does say to consider that. Court can say. Well, then let us take, Judge, let us take an initial step at what that policy might look like. Pass it right back. Yeah, so just so we can draft a policy. It'll probably be a couple of paragraphs. I'm yeah, sure. it doesn't have to be, yeah, but any kind of, the court has jurisdiction to determine its own policy sure. and procedure. This is really more procedure than policy. And so, but the court does have to act. Okay, so we'll all do each so. All right, number 15, Potter County Projects. Fine. Just a few items. Uh, the uh, short term law enforcement projects, the bids have been received. We've been currently evaluating them. We have a meeting this afternoon uh, with uh, architects. That would be Carrie, Vicki, Matt, myself, and John Kill. We've each had a section that we reviewed on each bid that has come through. We will give our report to each other today in order to present it to the committee this coming Thursday for the recommendation to come to the commissioner's court on the 20th because we will bring the general contractor to the court. Uh, Road and Bridge, the environmental project, we have our pre construction meeting tomorrow. This is on the old precinct building that's out there in order get it cleaned up. Hopefully we'll have it done within the next two or three weeks. The Santa Fe Elevator Mod Project are currently on the last elevator right now. Uh, they are anticipating to be completed December 15th. I actually believe it'll be more mid January before they uh, do a turnkey on that. And they're in liquidated damages. They're in currently starting uh, November 2nd liquidated damages. Uh, Big, big, he will need to go back through that contract. I know it was in there at $500 a day. It'd be prepared to eventually get a red letter to them whenever the final payment comes in. They had sent the last payout in. I rejected it. They go us out at 100% on the project and they just now start parking forward. So I told them uh, last Wednesday, just wait until you finish the project. Anything you're there, they sent one final invoice. So we'll need to take that into consideration. Pat, do you have anything from your station? Um, we started the <coughs> we had our pre-construction meeting on Wednesday after the last commissioner's court was approved. Uh, actually they started work on it on Friday of that week. Uh, it's proceeding very well. They've got all the they've done all the demolition, uh, the H the HVAC units are all in and the ducting is run just tied up in the ceiling right now waiting on the walls and everything to be built. They've got most of the framing done, uh, quite a bit, of, and they've started all the sheetrock and the electrical plumbing. It's coming along real well also. It's proceeding well. They were talking about uh, completion being uh, January 2nd. We can have before and after pictures that we used to have for our text. Post. We are taking pictures every day. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to do a little quick shout out to Nick and Mike and thank them for what they did to the ramp across the street from District Court's building. That was in, in really, really bad shape. We had a near uh, lawsuit um, just at hand. We had an attorney call and say, I've had three people. Who said they're going to sue you if you don't fix that? So, Mike and I met Nick, faced it in one weekend, and almost they said, Nick deserves credit for it. Thank you. That was a pretty quick job, too. Yeah, I mean, that was very good. 
Yeah, just two days. Yeah. It, was in, it was in such bad shape that I have two fairly good legs and I can barely go up it. So this is a guy in a wheelchair trying to get up it. He would be at a hard, hard time. Get in the building and make this somebody to help him. He called Shannon and complained to her. And, and so then the attorney called and said, well, I'm not going to sue you this time, but I'll go the next time. So we took action and I don't think really need to look at some of the other areas around the building. Okay, employment items. Uh, facilities maintenance, the resignation of Jason Red Darwin as mechanic technician form effective on April 15, 2016. Uh, number 17, the jail report. Oh, I'm sorry, I have to go again. Yeah. Motion. I have a motion to approve the employment items as presented. Second. And a motion to second on the paper. Zero, thank you. Number 17, the jail report. We have 570 individuals in our jail today. 94 of those are female. We don't have any children. And the, the, the ratio of felons is 81% to 12% misdemeanors. So, county insurance items, executive session. Agenda items for next time. That's just the uh, paragraph agreement that we talked about. And then we're also expecting an agenda item of uh, parking lots, our fairground parking lots. So Judge Tanner and I and Scott have been involved with some discussions with PIC and uh, we want to get everybody involved on what, what is currently on the table. So that we'll expect that next time. I just have one question for Sebastian. Uh, Walnut Hills Bridge, do you know when that's going to open? Uh, no, they're behind schedule as far as I know. They're they're not really there. nice. They they're not really nice. Really the the patient's on the side, so I went there and looked at it last year. It looks real nice as far as I can see. I went out a couple weeks ago. Uh, it's really looking strong. Yeah. I'm wondering when they're going to complete it. Are the residents, have you heard of it? I was wondering if any of them moved out. Well, I haven't got any complaints. Well, the biggest the complainers were have changed their mind as far as I know. Good. Uh, I mean, I think it's great. Really got to think about it, so this is not bad. Yeah. Were they able to move the bridge to, was it the city taking it over? I don't know why Thompson Park is in my city mind. They got the city took it, they have it storage, they're going to put it in a park that's not good. Yeah. Okay. okay. But it's going to be set up somewhere and then it's going to look good. I'm still surprised the city took it. <laughs> I'm not surprised at all. You're not? I'm thankful. Yeah, no, I think it has a lot of historical significance. It's not historical. <laughs> just step in my eye, probably uh, our first week, our first meeting in uh, December, we're going to invite the uh, Bushland School District superintendent to come and visit with us about some of the needs that they have out there on the streets. And uh, I don't know what we can do, but. Uh, we all need to be aware of the issues we have out there. Uh, they just <clears throat> made it worse by not uh, passing their school bond election. And, uh, so there's some real serious issues. Uh, Sebastian and Tony and Tad and I went out and met with them a week or so ago. And uh, we asked them to come in and uh, let you all know. So. It won't be next meeting, but probably the next one. 